All right, so this lesson is going to be all about the fossil record. And before we can talk about the record, we have to know what a fossil is. So the fossil is the remains or the imprints of a once living thing. And there are many different types of fossils. Now, a lot of us think that what we're going to do is dig into the ground and we're going to find an entire Tyrannosaurus rex, but it's not really how it works. There are two major types of fossils we can talk about. The first type, and these are the most exciting, would be body fossils. These are going to be the casts or molds of mineralized remains of part of the anatomy of the organism you're looking for. This can be things like teeth, bones, leaves, or shells. We like them so much because it allows us to see what these things look like. But what oftentimes geologists use or paleontologists use are things called trace fossils. And what trace fossils do are record the activities of the organism. It gives us an idea of how they ate, how they nested, how they moved around. So when we find things like footprints or nests or burrows or even scat, which is, yes, fossilized poo, it actually tells us quite a bit about that animal. So we actually have a sample of that fossilized poo for you to see in class, and you guys panicked about seeing the rock schist at one time. Well, Spencer, you'll love this one. Okay, so now that we know what a fossil is, it's time to talk about how fossils form. So it turns out fossils are more rare than you think. Not everything that died in the past actually gets turned into a fossil that we can find today. In order for an organism to become a fossil, after it dies, it needs to experience rapid burial by very fine sediment. Now, rapid is the key word here. Once something dies, it's going to begin to decay, and things are going to eat it, and the environment is going to scatter its remains to different places. So we need to have that sediment layer drop on top of our remains as quickly as possible. So once these rocks start to form, layer upon layer will build up. And there are two laws about sedimentary rock that's going to be really important with respect to the fossil layer. The first is called the law of original horizontality. I know that's a mouthful, but what it's basically saying is layers originally start by being parallel stripes on top of one another. We know these as strata from our sedimentary rock unit. And the next one is called the law of superposition. And all that law says is basically the layers on the bottom are going to be older than the layers on top, which kind of makes sense because how can you drop something off on top of something that doesn't exist? So what that's going to be able to do is give us what's called the relative ages of our fossils. When we find the remains of something down here, we know it has to be older than something up here. And using that law, we'll now build upon what the fossil record tells us. Okay, so here comes big idea number one. Now that we have superposition in place, and we know that the guy down here is older than the guy up here, it's time to make some observations about those fossils that we see. So the biggest thing is, older, deeper fossils are more simple than more shallow, newer fossils, which basically lends the hypothesis, as time goes on, things evolved and became more complex, which then says, if I've got something old and simple down here, and something new and complex up here, then somewhere in the middle, which we would call intermediate, we should see some gradual changes taking place. And guess what? That's exactly what we see in the fossil record. We're actually able to see ancestors and descendants sharing some sort of common lineage in the layers in between where we find their fossils. All right. Here's big idea number two with the fossil record as evidence for evolution. Transitional fossils show evidence that old and new forms of life are actually related to each other. So there are a couple of big boys when it comes to the famous fossils we've pulled out of the ground, and the first is known as Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx makes the link between a chicken and a Tyrannosaurus rex. Well, maybe not that specifically, but at least between today's modern birds of prey and ancient dinosaurs. So what we can see in Ar Archaeopteryx is that it has a beak, it has feathers, it has wings, and it has the wishbone that we all fight over on Thanksgiving. But what it also has is a full mouth of teeth, a long bony tail, and claws on its wings that were actually still used to grab its prey both indicating that it has traits of the dinosaurs and today's common birds. 
So for those of you who think whales are fish, think again. Whales are mammals. They do not have gills. They in fact have lungs and breathe air. They also give birth to live young, which they nurse and have tiny little hair on their bodies. So these odd gigantic mammals actually give us another really great transitional fossil example for evidence of evolution. So we have these ancient whales called Ambulocetus and Dorida. And what we can see in these fossils are the makings of what used to be a land mammal making its way into the oceans because it gave it a competitive edge for food. Believe it or not, whales actually share common ancestry with the hippopotamus. So if we took a look at Ambulocetus, which is a really ancient version of the whale, what we can start to see is a four-legged land animal starting to shorten its legs and starting to get very enlarged hands and feet, which would later become flippers for paddling in the water. And when we take a look at Dorodon, what we can actually see are the nostrils, which started out on the front of its head, working its way back on its skull, and will eventually become a blowhole, which the whales now use to breathe. In addition, Dorodon, on the far end of the back of its tail, has little vestigial remnants of legs, which its ancient ancestors have. In fact, if you were to take a look at a lot of whale species today, their skeletons still show that evidence of vestigial hind legs. Clear evidence that what we have is an evolved mammal from an ancient ancestor. All right, at this point, I know what you're thinking. We've talked about birds, we've talked about dinosaurs, we've talked about whales, we've even talked about a hippo. And what you're probably saying to yourself now is, what about us? If humans are going to go through the same evolution as all other organisms, then shouldn't there be something in the fossil record that points to that? And the answer is absolutely. If we take a look at our ancient ancestors and their fossils that we pull out of the ground, Starting with things like Australopithecus, which we found trace fossils that showed us they went from walking on four legs to standing up and being bipedal, which means they walk on two legs. We can then go into other types that have large teeth, they have more powerful jaws. We start to see us becoming omnivores. And then our most recent ancestors, guys like Homo habilis and Homo neanderthalus, what we see in their fossils are that they have larger brains and we start to get artifacts for the first time. These guys made tools. They had opposable thumbs. They were able to hunt and farm and do things that we today are able to do. So humans are no exception to the fact that the fossil record is clear evidence of evolution and what we'll go on in later videos to show you is that there's much, much more that makes this theory less of a theory and more of just an accepted fact in the scientific community. Okay, one more thing. You. Yeah, I'm pointing to you. The guy who thinks that we evolved from apes. That's not how it worked. For those of you that look at a chimpanzee and say, well, they share 98.6% of our DNA. We evolved from a chimp. One day a chimp just made a human. No, that is not how it works. They are our relatives, much like a cousin. We share ancestry with something deep in the past, but we did not descend directly from chimpanzees. And that's why we and they are both still here today.